States of Divine Consciousness, page 59. Thus, this subtle conscious human soul is capable of wielding tremendous power and is quite capable of giving sight to the blind or limbs to the maimed. This is the domain of the first three planes and the capability of this soul to liberate energy in any intensity is achieved according to the degree of subtle consciousness gained by it in the second and third planes. While this subtle conscious human soul in its realm of energy consciously makes use of energy in its nascent state, it is unconscious of the mental. Therefore, unconsciously, it makes use of the aspects of mind, such as thoughts, desires, and emotions. Thus, though it is capable of wielding tremendous power through its consciousness of energy, it is susceptible to getting entangled by mind while making use of the aspects of mind unconsciously. For this reason, this subtle conscious human soul, although mighty powerful, sometimes slides down to the lower level of subtle consciousness while making conscious use of its energy in the form of miraculous powers. To be more precise, the subtle conscious human soul is either in the first or second or third plane according to the degree of subtle consciousness gained. Or one may say that the domain of the subtle sphere comprises the first, second, and third planes. Now the fourth plane is that state of consciousness which draws a line of demarcation between the domain of the subtle world and the domain of the mental world. In other words, the subtle conscious human atma on the fourth plane is like a human soul standing on the threshold of the mental world, which delimits the subtle world from the mental world. Therefore, the subtle conscious human soul at the stage of consciousness of the fourth plane is fully conscious of the first, second, and third planes and experiences in full the subtle world. And so is completely conscious of the tremendous energy of the subtle world. Thus, this human soul on the threshold of the mental world, commanding the energy at its height, is now nearest to the domain of mind, which is the mental world, and thus is much more susceptible to the overpowering forces of the aspects of the mind. V-I-Z, which translates into, therefore, the thoughts, desires, and emotions. And although this subtle conscious human soul on the fourth plane consciously makes use of the subtle world's energy at its zenith, it is still unconscious of mind. It therefore unconsciously makes use of the aspects of mind, 
which are now too overpowering and thus most alluring for this soul, which, so to speak, has to face and bear the full blast of the aspects of the mind. Paren, thoughts, desires, and emotions, close paren, at their highest. This situation for the human soul on the fourth plane is extremely dangerous since it is extremely treacherous. Here the soul, equipped with highest energy, which can be put to use either for the best or for the worst, has to maintain a sort of equilibrium of two forces at their zenith, at their zenith, that is, the height of the energy of the subtle world and the overpowering height of aspects of the mind of the mental world. If this human soul on the fourth plane, while unconsciously using the aspects of mind, is overcome by the overpowering allurements of these aspects, thoughts, desires, and emotions, he then cannot resist using energy at its climax for the worst by performing powerful miracles, such as raising the dead, curing the blind, the sick and the maimed, etc., just to satisfy his own overpowering desires. He is even capable of creating the whole world of forms with all of its creation. So great is the power obtained from the energy at its height of which the subtle conscious human soul is conscious. Thus, this misuse of energy at its zenith through the medium and the overpowering allurements of the aspects of mind also at their zenith, creates a sort of tremendous irreparable short circuit in the two fundamental supernatural forces of energy at its zenith in the shape of stupendous power and of mind at its zenith in the shape of irresistible desire, resulting in an unimaginably tremendous clash and explosion in the advanced consciousness of the subtle conscious human soul of the fourth plane. Absolute disturbance is thus created in the consciousness of this soul, resulting in downright disintegration of the advanced consciousness of this human soul. Thereupon, this subtle conscious human soul invariably falls to the lowest level of consciousness, which is the most finite type of consciousness of the crudest form. Therefore, this human soul has to take the form of stone and has again to go through the process of evolution. Thanks, Marion. Ernie, could you continue, please? Example of a gross conscious scientist. Let us try to explain this situation by an illustration of what sometimes occurs, even on the gross plane, to an ordinary human being who handles tremendous power and who, and who is more often than not overcome by an intense desire to demonstrate his powers. Let us compare then a subtle conscious human soul on the fourth plane, such as described above, with a great scientist of repute in the gross world. The latter 
being fully conscious of the gross plane by sheer dent of effort and much investigation into the fields of the science of energies, fully realizes the possibility of releasing tremendous energy through certain experiments. This scientist, we will assume for the purposes of our illustration, gradually becomes fully conscious of the tremendous energy that has come within his reach and which will ultimately come under his complete control. He then desires intensely to make use of it. Even when this gross conscious scientist in the gross world is conscious of the highest possible gross aspect of energy, he is not at all conscious of that energy in its nascent state which is only of the domain of the subtle world and which can only be experienced and controlled by the subtle conscious human soul and which can never under any circumstances be experimented with or experienced by any gross conscious human being. Therefore, when this gross conscious scientist in the gross conscious world on earth is conscious of the highest possible gross aspects of nuclear energy, he is actually fully conscious of only one of the highest gross aspects of energy of the domain of the subtle world. And when this scientist who is conscious of one of the highest gross aspects of energy which is now entirely under his control, is overpowered by an intense desire, which is also the highest aspect of mind of the mental world, to use it, then the scientist's whole career hangs in the balance. And it is thus very often at stake. It is at this juncture of conflicting thoughts which on the one hand provoke the scientist to demonstrate his powers and on the other hand soothe him to become reticent that the scientist has to be extremely careful to maintain an equilibrium that is balancing the tremendous aspects of energy at his disposal it rests with him either to use it for the welfare of the world or to misuse it for its devastating effects, or not to use it at all. He is confronted with the irresistible, overpowering force of the predominant aspect of mind in the shape of intense desires, which haunt him with fame, name, and power, tickling his ego to the utmost towards selfish ends irrespective of the potential destruction and devastation which can be wrought. If the scientist succumbs, therefore, to this overweening desire, which is now at its zenith, and is thereby directed for his selfish ends to misuse the power that he controls in the form of one of the highest aspects of energy, he then consciously leads himself to attempt to explode the most deadly weapon in his control, more powerful than, say, the latest hydrogen bomb. It is at this stage that the crucial point is reached. The scientist explodes his weapon, spreading devastating results, and the equilibrium which was thus far very narrowly maintained between use of power and overpowering desire is absolutely disturbed. This scientist could not con content himself and was incapable of maintaining an equilibrium or balance between the tremendous aspect of energy that lay latent in his weapon, which fortified him with power and the intense desire to explode the weapon consciously, unmatched, un unmindful of the unimaginable result. 
the tragedy of the whole thing was that this scientist being conscious of and intensely self-interested in the result of the explosion of the bomb was the first to be directly affected by the blast of the explosion, despite all of the necessary precautions taken. This immediate consequence to himself was that at first he was completely overpowered by his own experiment and was aghast and he fell flat on the ground, absolutely unconscious. To add to this tragedy, when he regained his consciousness, he regained it at what cost? He had completely forgotten his state as a great and advanced scientist. And he was also incapable of remembering his immediate past, his boyhood, and his activities as a young man with all of their associations with wife, children, and friends. The greatest change that took place in him was that he did not even feel that he had lost anything. In other words, his memory and his consciousness of being a great scientist. The doctors call such an occurrence a case of amnesia. He had consciousness only of the fact that he was a man of the most rudimentary type. He then started his life afresh, never once imagining that he had lived the life of a great man of science who had, who had, under, who had had under his control vast and tremendous forces of energy. In a similar fashion occurs the tragedy of the most advanced, subtle conscious human soul on the fourth plane. He has been, he, he being energy personified, misuses the energy at its zenith in the subtle world and consequently loses all consciousness except the most finite consciousness, which according to the law of evolution has to take the most crude form of stone to experience that most finite consciousness. Thanks, Ern. Mahu. Yes. One of the functions of perfect masters is to guard the soul of the fourth plane from wrecking his spiritual career through the misuse of divine powers. Asterisk. So I read the explanation. It says, being asked by the editors about Jesus' temptations. Meher Baba replied, the truth is that Jesus was not tempted by Satan, but that Jesus got himself tempted and he overcame the temptations. There was a great purpose behind this. He had to get himself tempted. Thereby, he should read, he, he shouldered um, the burden. Shouldered. Oh, shouldered. She, yeah, he shouldered. Oh, <laughs> okay. Thereby, he shouldered the burden of the forces of temptations that predominated in the world. Jesus then overcame all the temptations and in that way created a tremendous force which acted as a great setback to the forces of universal temptations. The same was true in the case of Buddha. And it is the same every time in avatarik periods. Whenever God manifests on earth as avatar, is God who gives a universal push, and the result is universal. For example, not only the humanity reaps the benefit, but everything in the whole creation reaps the benefit of the universal push. Hmm. Going back to the text again, 
Very often, if the soul of the fourth plane is about to lose control of his mind, his powers are snatched away by the perfect masters who can control the minds of all subtle conscious and gross conscious souls. The cases of actual downfall are accordingly rare and occur as expectations to the rule, as an exceptions to the rule, sorry. They must ultimately be attributed not to any failure in the vigilance maintained by the perfect masters, but to the original urge within God himself. So it is literally true that each and everything small or great that happens in the universe happens only according to the will of the almighty. Hmm. Here it is important to know that though it is an established fact that once full consciousness is gained in the human form, it is virtually never lost. Yet, in this case of the subtle conscious human soul on the fourth plane, there is the possibility of losing the consciousness gained. This occurs if the powers of the fourth plane are misused and if the equilibrium is not maintained with the highest energy at command, counterbalanced by the overpowering allurement of infinite desires, which are the highest aspect of mind. Though the, 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 though the three, the three fundamental aspects of mind are thoughts, desires, and emotions. The desires form the highest aspect of mind. But if the subtle conscious human soul on the fourth plane does not misuse the energy commanded by it and maintains the equilibrium by discrete use of infinite energy for the best, then this soul on the fourth plane, um, oh, then this soul on the fourth plane not only crosses this threshold of the fourth plane and enters the domain of the fifth and sixth planes of the mental world, but gains consciousness of the sixth plane directly. This is because this soul with subtle conscious and discrete use of energy at its zenith was capable of overcoming and resisting the most of allure, alluring and overpowering highest aspects of mind, the desires, thoughts, and emotions, which were most powerfully uh, treacherous at their zenith. Thus, this other conscious human soul gains directly the consciousness of the sixth plane by overpowering the desires, thoughts, and emotions at their zenith and becomes their master who now controls them and even has the capacity to create them. Some subtle conscious human souls neither use nor misuse the tremendous fraud of energy at its height, liberated in the southern world. And when such souls do not fall prey to their desires, which are also at their height, these subtle conscious human souls 
across the threshold of the fourth plane and gain the consciousness of the fifth plane in the domain of the mental world. Here, these mental conscious human souls are no longer the slaves of their mind because they are now conscious of the first state of mind which controls thoughts. The mental conscious human souls on the fifth and sixth planes are now fully conscious of mind and experience the mental world according to the degree of advancement of consciousness of the fifth and sixth planes. These mental conscious human souls of the fifth and sixth planes are no longer conscious of the degree of consciousness of the first, second, and third, and fourth planes of the southern world. Nor do they experience the southern world any longer. Therefore, these mental conscious human souls are unconscious of the tremendous energy of the southern world. Hence, these mental conscious human souls, although they are conscious masters of mind, are now absolutely unconscious of the power of energy of the southern world. And it is for this reason that these mental conscious human souls never can perform any miracles. They can neither raise the dead, nor can they give sight to the blind, nor limbs to the maimed in spite of their advanced consciousness being greater than the consciousness of the subtle conscious human soul. However, as these mental conscious human souls are the conscious masters of mind, they can create and control the minds of the gross conscious and subtle conscious human souls. For them, creating and controlling minds is but, is but child's play, if necessary. Thank you, Mahu. Mona, could you unmute and continue? Can you hear me? Yes. In the case of the mental conscious human soul, let us suppose that its position is near the sun, which we have taken for our standard as a smile. Simile. As a simile. This soul in human form consciously imbibes and controls the aspects of mind, such as thoughts, desires, and emotions, and makes in the mental world the fullest of use of mind, which proceeds from the sun, which we, for our purpose of explanation, consider as the source. Thus, this mental conscious human soul in the realms of the fifth and sixth planes is not only fully conscious of the mind and its aspects, but it is also capable of creating and controlling the thoughts, desires, and emotions of all other minds too. The soul is now quite stable and can never fall or slide down to any lower levels of consciousness, as could the subtle conscious human soul on the fourth plane, because the gross conscious human soul and subtle conscious human soul are the slaves of their minds, whereas the mental conscious human soul is the master of his mind. Finally, the case of the self-conscious <coughs> human soul 
is like a soul in the sun itself. While trying to understand the explanation, one should bear in mind that the reference to the sun is given only as a form of simile. One must not misunderstand this sun as our earthly sun, nor misunderstand our earthly sun as the real standard of the infinite and eternal soul of infinite power, knowledge and bliss. Nor must we attach any significance whatsoever to our earth sun, for our earth sun is nothing but one of the objects of creation of the soul's own creating. This self-conscious human soul of the seventh plane is conscious of this sun, which we have taken as an example of the source of energy and mind. And although he invariably experiences and radiates ex Eternally, the infinite power, knowledge. Eternally. In some cases, such a soul also makes use of his infinite power, knowledge, and bliss directly and consciously for the emancipation of souls from the sanskaras of the gross, subtle, and mental worlds. Part 7. The Sevenfold Veil Kabir was a perfect master as well as a poet. Kabir Wani, his book of poems is therefore the most unique because of his lucid expositions on God, love for God, the divine path and illusory creation. Being a perfect master, Kabir has said things as much for the man in the street oh sorry Mo uh, sorry uh, Mona your your internet is is disappearing so uh, Kabir Wani his book of poems is it, therefore it, 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 sorry allegory as well as secret truly understand the deeper meaning underlying most of his sayings excuse me um, yogis, excuse me mona practice a system mona. of esoteric knowledge who can of themselves suspend their physical bodies in midair during the time they are in a temporary um, I don't think Mona can hear us. So l let me go from, from the top. Kabir was a perfect master as well as a poet. Kabir Wani, his book of poems, is therefore the more unique because of his lucid expositions on God, love for God, the divine path, and illusory creation. Being a perfect master, Kabir has said things as much for the man in the street as for the initiate. initiate. Mm. He does not hesitate to disclose both allegorically mm. as well as in plain words some of the spiritual secrets which, though within the grasp of ordinary man, are yet known only to the spiritually illumined ones who alone truly understand the deeper meaning underlying most of his sayings. There are yogis, those who practice a systematic course of esoteric knowledge, who can of themselves suspend 
their physical bodies in midair during the time they are in a temporary samadhi, trance. There are some who can bodily walk on water or fly in the air without the aid of external means. And yet all this is no sign or proof of their having experienced divine love. Weighed on spiritual scales, these miracles have no value whatsoever. In fact, miracle mongering by the average yogi is not only poles apart from the spiritual path, but is actually a hindrance to the individual's evolution towards spiritual progress. The following incident in the life of a Hindu master shows the disregard in which it is held by perfect masters who are truth personified. The master was one day by the river's edge waiting for one of the little ferry boats that take passengers across the stream for the diminutive fare of one Anna. A yogi, seeing him thus waiting, came up to him, literally walked across the river and back and said, that was much easier, was it not? The master smilingly replied, yes, and had less value than that of the boat fare, one Anna. Marion, are you ready to continue? You have to unmute. Yes, I am ready to continue. Um, the ability to exercise constant control over one's low desires is no mean achievement. Success in establishing a lasting sublimation of all desires is indeed a greater one. But the greatest is the burning away of all one's desires once and for all, which divine love alone can do. As there is never any show about divine love, this burning in love is always without smoke, that is, without show. There are times when an outward expression of God love may amount to heroism, but to make at any time a mere show of one's love for God, for the sake of show, amounts to an insult to God. That is why Kabir says that in the act of meditation, when one assumes an asan posture to meditate upon God, one should, one should at that time learn to avoid making any display, such as the swaying motion of one's body, even if it is only for one's own gratification. As compared with dreams, the physical life is indeed a reality. Similarly, compared with the reality of the path, the world and all worldly life is vacant dreaming on the part of man. But as the world and all of its experiences are illusory, so is the spiritual path that leads to reality. The former may be termed false illusion and the latter real illusion. Nevertheless, Despite the vast difference between them, they are both illusions, for God alone is the only reality. 
when knowledge in the sense of wisdom rather than of worldly knowledge is gained, ignorance is banished. But for ignorance to go, knowledge must be gained. On the one hand, God and the capacity of man to see and become one with God are always there. On the other hand, truth remains hidden from man until he actually arrives upon the path or realizes God. This apparent anomaly is due to two different factors. Man's ignorance of truth and the fact that truth is beyond the faculty of reason and far, far above the sphere of intellect. The fact remains that man has become God and man can become God for the simple reason that knowingly or unknowingly man is God. Only so long as man's ignorance lasts will there seem to be no end to the plural diversity of illusory things. When divine knowledge is gained, he realizes that there is no end to the indivisible oneness of God. <sighs> Under the illusion of cosmic duality, the apparent separation between man and God is invariably referred to by masters in terms of the intervenient veil and curtain. Hafiz, who was a perfect master as well as a great poet says, تو خود هجاب خودی حافظا از میان برخیز there in in english there is no barrier between the lover and beloved hafiz lift yourself aside you are yourself the covering over self it's with a capital s Kabir, referring to the removal of the seven folds of the veil, says, Mahu. This is Urdu, so I'm not very good at this. Tere guk gata, kepata, kola tuje, rama milaga. And in English, Open the folds of your veil and you shall find God. The gungat literally means the covering that a woman extends over her head and face in a number of folds. In spiritual parlance, it represents the heavy folds of ignorance that keep man hidden from his real identity. The lifting of it, fold by fold, corresponds to the stage by stage journey of a pilgrim from the first to the fifth plane of the divine path. The veil that separates a man in ignorance from God who is all knowledge is so subtle that even the highest and finest thought cannot pierce through it. This veil consists of seven folds of seven different deep colors. Each fold is tied with a separate knot. Thus, there are seven knots to the seven folds. The seven colors represent the seven root desires corresponding to the seven fundamental impressions, that is, lust, greed, anger, etc., connected with the seven openings of sensations in the, fa in the face, such as one, mouth, two, 
right nostril, three, left nostril, four, right ear, five, left ear, six, right eye, seven, left eye. In reality, and as the only reality, the soul is always God, without beginning and without end. False illusion begins with the descent of the soul in seven material stages. And real illusion ends with the ascent of the soul to the seventh spiritual plane. God is a macrocosm. God is a microcosm. And God is also always beyond both. Knowingly, man is body and man is mind. But unknowingly, as in deep sleep, man is also beyond both. Analogically, it is true that man is made in the image of God. The top of his head represents the vinyan, bumika, arsh, e Allah, the highest spiritual state, or the seat of Brahman. The forehead corresponds to the entrance to divinity. The center of the forehead just above the two external eyes is the seat of the inner or third eye. When the veil with all its seven folds is finally removed, man is then able through the third eye to see God face to face and sees him more actually and naturally than what he is ordinarily able to see of his body and the world through the two external eyes. In order to arrive at the divine entrance situated in the forehead, man has to pass through the seven doors as represented by the seven physical openings in the face. Thanks, Marion. Earn. When an initiate succeeds in actually entering the divine path, it is for him a single seven in one achievement. And it applies to the first of the seven folds of the veil. Unfast number one, unfastening of the first knot. Two, disappearance of the first fold. Three, crushing out of the first root desires. Four, wiping out of the relative fundamental impressions. Five, doing away with the first of the seven deep dark colors. Six, entrance through the first door as represented by the mouth. And seven, arriving on the first plane in the subtle sphere, the pran, buvan, or the alam, a malakut. In dreams, an ordinary man is able to make partial use of his subtle body with subtle consciousness, but only in respect to gross experience and concerning only gross objects. Just as he experiences the gross world with full gross consciousness through his gross body, so the initiate on the first plane begins to experience the subtle world with subtle consciousness through his subtle body. If the initiate is able to proceed further and manages to maintain progress, he continues in the subtle sphere up to the fourth plane. This progress involves the second and third successive single 
seven in one achievements that parallel the sevenfold results achieved in the first. This passing through the second and third doors represented by the right and left nostrils brings a still greater intensification of the real illusion. In other words, higher consciousness of the path. After going through the second door, the initiate, initiate realizes even more the wonderful things of the subtle world and, and at the same time begins to run the risk of being lost in the maze of wonderment. The mystical enchantments of the path beyond the third door are still greater, and so also are the chances of becoming spellbound by them. Just as those with gross consciousness take the gross fear and its illusory experiences to be real, so the pilgrims in the subtle sphere, while absorbed in the wonder of the plane on which they are, may mistake it for the ultimate reality. Hence, a pilgrim often gets stuck on a plane, deluded by its raptures into accepting it as the goal, until a perfect master or even mental conscious souls help him by pushing him onto the next plane. The fourth seven-in-one achievement is a double achievement because at one and the same time, one, the fourth and fifth knots are unfastened, two, the fourth and fifth folds disappear, three, the fourth and fifth root desires are crushed, four, the fourth and fifth deep dark colors vanish, five, the fourth and fifth relative fundamental impressions are wiped out. Six, the fourth and fifth doors, parens, as represented by the right and left ears, closed parens, are passed through. And seven, the pilgrim arrives on the highest plane of the subtle sphere, the fourth plane. As said before, the fourth plane is a plane of spiritual splendor and of divine powers. Parens, Anwar, O Tajalat, or, sit, or Situs, close parens. Pilgrims advanced this far can, among other things, even raise the dead. They run a very grave risk of misusing these powers, thereby inviting disaster. And only a very few can independently cross these dizzy heights safely without the aid of a perfect master. It is said, said of them that Hafiz, that Hafiz says, Mahu. در آستان جانان اسمان آسمان بیندیش که از اوج سر بلندی افتی به کار پستی In English, on the threshold of the beloved, beware of the allurements of the heavens, lest you bring about your fall from the heights of progress and greatness to the depths of degradation and ruin. In such a case, a man is not only deprived of the spiritual progress he has made on the path, but is thrown back from the position that he had achieved through physiological evolution to the state of the stone form. Just as anything may happen to a man traveling over an unknown path in the pitch darkness of the night, so anything may happen to one who must pass through the fourth plane without the guiding hand of a perfect master. That is why for all its dazzling splendor and power, the period of going through the fourth plane 
is termed in Christian mysticism, the dark night of the soul. Thank you, Ernie. And we'll continue here at the top of page 72 next time.